Hello, we are doing um, a knowledge transfer session for Windows Service Wrapper. Uh, we have uh, multiple participants on the call. Uh, thanks, Mike, and thanks, uh, Budika, for joining. Uh, just to share some context uh, for those who are interested. Um, and this year, we have a number of Google Summer of Code projects, and one of them is related to improvements in Jenkins uh, Windows Services. Uh, we use a component called the Windows Service Wrapper, um, and this component basically provides us uh, uh, opportunity to run uh, masters and agents uh, on Windows and to register them as Windows services. So this year we wanted to add YAML configuration and also to improve uh, verification of the configurations. Uh, today we will um, uh, um, do basically a code dive. We will take a look at the Windows service wrapper repository and code structure. We will also talk about how this uh, component is used in Jenkins. And then we will have some discussion about how we could improve the configuration so that uh, we keep uh, talking about uh, the project implementation. Does that sound uh, good to you? Yep. Okay, so uh, let's just start from the beginning. A Windows Service Wrapper is a standalone project. And now it's hosted in a Windows Service Wrapper uh, GitHub organization. It's a transition that we've done a couple of months ago together with next term. Um, currently, it's been used by multiple uh, organizations, not only by the Jenkins project. So you can see that there are 4,000 stars uh, and uh, we almost hit 1 million downloads. Uh, so yeah, it's used in Jenkins, but uh, there are many other organizations using that. And um, actually, it's a really good tool right now. Uh, what does it offer? Uh, actually, a Windows Service Wrapper is a binary which you can execute. Um, so it provides uh, versions for .NET, framework, for .NET Framework, different versions, and also for .NET Core. Uh, so if you don't have .NET installed, so you can take a native executable for 64 32-bit platform and to run it as is. So what commands does it offer? Mm, it uh, provides uh, several commands like uh, install, uh, union installs um, uh, for installing service and also start stop uh, and uh, a number of other uh, commands. Uh, so basically you can use them in order to install your service, your application as a service. Uh, let me quickly show it to you. Yeah, just a second. I should have a demo for that. Or maybe not. Okay. So, yeah, there is a lot of uh, documents which we don't need. I will just uh, take a demo from this folder. Uh, documents. Uh, so, we will just need for these files, I guess. These files. Yeah, I'm running the demo on Windows due to all these reasons. Okay, so we have a number of files. Actually, in order to run a Windows Service Wrapper, you need two files at the moment. One file is uh, executable. So okay, I have two executables, one uh, for common, uh, another one for um, uh, the .NET Core, and also we have a configuration file. So this configuration file is uh, really simple. Uh, well, it won't work actually, but uh, it would uh, install an abstract executable um, as a service uh, in your Windows setup. And you can just uh, run it. So for example, uh, I will just say Windows Service Wrapper install. And let's see what happens. Uh, do we see user's account control screen? Okay, maybe not. So anyway, uh, it uh, required me to elevate permissions and after that I uh, installed it as my application. So then I can go to services and here, for example, uh, you will have an application called, how it was called, my app service. Mm. So yeah, uh, my app service powered by Windows Service Wrapper. 
And here you can find a number of properties like startup type, also login credentials, recovery options, and the dependencies to be used. All these options uh, can be configured uh, uh, through advanced properties. So if you go here, you can find that uh, there is my XML configuration file. And actually there is quite a long list of options here. And hopefully we will be able to get the same options in uh, YAML uh, once Kudika uh, finishes uh, the project. So yeah, uh, that's uh, what Windows Service uh, Wrapper does. And yeah, same manner I can you know, install this service. Well, let's uh, try to start it first, because yeah, most likely nothing good will happen. Okay, so yeah, it uh, installed, but uh, because we didn't uh, force logs, and now if you open a Windows log, you can actually see that well, my executable started because actually I have it as such executable. No, I don't. Um, it should be just in the application log. Okay, let's uh, you install that and uh, then switch to our demo. Okay. So I can uh, show the code structure in uh, two ways. One I can just use GitHub, another one I, I can use Visual Studio. So what would you prefer? I guess Visual Studio would be a bit more professional, um, but we can just uh, start uh, uh, from GitHub, if you wish. So here we have um, a number of um, uh, directories. So all this source code is located in the CRC folder. Uh, we also have a number of other folders. So Dolph is just all the documentation, uh, including cancellation guides, uh, guidelines for reporting, also uh, configuration description I described. And then we have Ang folder, uh, which includes uh, build YAML. So basically, it's our uh, uh, configuration that we use on Azure DevOps to build um, uh, the project. In order to release the project, uh, right now we use another pipeline, which is not published in the repository, but hopefully we'll move it here soon. And we also have examples, but basically there are two examples. One is sample minimal. So this is the file you have seen. And another one is just sample all options. So basically it's, uh, well, again, it's uh, a file which includes all examples and which includes some documentation. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this file. Uh, the intention was to just uh, show an example, but maybe we could uh, move this entire file, for example, to access this schema so that uh, this documentation and center moves there and users can uh, develop uh, configurations interactively. So it's something to discuss in the future. And yes, our main file is actually uh, SRC. So what do we have here? Here we have uh, a solution. So what it means is that uh, this um, is actually a multi-project repository and uh, this solution defines uh, the top level build. So for example, uh, in Java, there is example like uh, Maven parent form uh, in multi, or just, uh, yeah, in multi model repositories here, we have uh, approximately the same. Um, and yeah, there are also .NET settings, but it doesn't really provide uh, a lot of information here. It's just used for the build flow to uh, the right uh, versions and other components. And yeah, now we go deeper. So there are three folders. One is for tests. Uh, we will uh, discuss them later, but yeah, obviously it's about tests. Uh, then uh, there is uh, plugins. So Windows Service Wrapper has a, a primitive uh, plugin subsystem. This plugin subsystem is basically documented, uh, just a second here, um, the extension points. Did I remove that entirely? Yeah, no, sorry, it's here, extensions. So in Windows Service Wrapper, you can uh, define uh, overrides in order to inject additional logic. And uh, two extensions are included into the repository specifically. So there is shared directory mapper and runaway process killer. So next turn uh, wants uh, to kill this repository and to replace by native features, but uh, shared directory mapper is still makes sense. So most likely we will pick this extension engine. And our main repository, yeah, so I don't top. 
and our main repository is core. So basically core is uh, the logic of Windows Service Wrapper. It uh, consists of uh, uh, two components. One is Windows Service Core. So it's basically a library which includes the most of uh, components and extension API, etc. And the second uh, project is Service Wrapper. So Service Wrapper basically defines main uh, C-sharp, uh, which uh, implements a startup project. Um, it basically uses uh, the library. And uh, it also has some features for logging. And finally, this uh, repository defines how we package uh, uh, Windows Service Wrapper. So for example, here you can see the configuration we produce. So for example, here we have uh, mm, uh, dependencies we inject um, and also um, we have targets. So for example, uh, we create a zip file for .NET Core, we create uh, executables. You can see destinations where they go, and uh, that's how it happens. And also, we have uh, a number of uh, .NET executables. So for .NET executables, uh, there is one uh, curious thing that uh, we merge the labels. So if you go to the built directory, uh, let's go to our repository. So what I'm doing? Oops. Hopefully nothing copied. Sometimes it's awkward. Okay. So here we just I have a broken mouse. I now I realized what happened. Okay, here we have um, a development repository. Uh, and for example, if we just go to our SRC core uh, Windows Service Wrapper, uh, you can see two folders. We are interested in BIM. So here, for example, for .NET 2.0, we produce a number of DLLs. So it re really summarizes uh, the libraries we use. So for example, we use uh, uh, a library for managing zip files. We use Log4Net, it's a logging um, library. We also include our extensions. And uh, we also include our Windows Service Wrapper core. And there is a simple executable there, but this executable doesn't include these libraries. So this is how uh, the uh, .NET applications uh, are usually being shipped if you build them by default with Visual Studio. But what we do, we actually merge all this stuff into um, a single DLL. So here you can see that we do the same basically for all platforms. So for the all .NET versions, and we just take all the assemblies, include them, and then we generate it a single artifact. So for that we use Illmerge. Illmerge is just one of uh, standard uh, uh, tools for .NET. Um, and, uh, yeah, we include it here. So what it gives us, um, if you go to Windows Service, we have artifacts. And here you have the finally produced artifacts. So here we have exe files and a PDB, it's a symbol uh, files for debugging. So that's all we get. And uh, this uh, distributables which we can distribute. So you can see that uh, the size of them is quite small. Um, and actually, this is uh, the executable we use in Jenkins. Notably, the executable for the last uh, .NET uh, version is smaller because we started uh, excluding some code which is no longer needed there. So thanks to next turn for this for this work. So these are uh, uh, classic artifacts. Mm, and yeah, as I said, we also have .NET Core artifacts. Uh, they are a bit bigger. So for example, if we go to the GitHub releases, you can see the recent releases and not .NET Core artifacts is more than 30 megabytes. So why it happens? Uh, well, basically we include uh, .NET Engine there. So these artifacts can run on any x64 or 86 version of Windows. They do not require .NET. They're portable, but yeah, of course, they're bigger. So if you use Java, you could do the same, for example, by using Quarkus or whatever to create na uh, native uh, distributions. Okay, so this is structure in principle. Before we proceed, do you have any questions? Are you still here?
Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry. <coughs> I don't know where it's at all. Okay, so this is what we have in terms of uh, the build flow. Uh, so, so all the build is basically defined by project files. So it's yeah, I switched uh, to Visual Studio because it's a bit more convenient here. Uh, is the screen big enough? Maybe not. Yeah, I can read it. Okay, so yeah, here, by the way, uh, yeah, it's uh, better to answer in voice because uh, otherwise I have to go and open the chat. So here, um, uh, the build flow is basically defined uh, and we produce the artifacts. So how do we test uh, that? Um, here, oh, we haven't discussed the window service core yet, right? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, Windows Service uh, Wrapper was an executable, and uh, yeah, a Windows Service uh, Core is basically a main component. So it's a library which includes a lot of things, uh, notable things uh, which uh, matter in this project is server descriptor. So so service descriptor is basically a configuration file. So you can see that uh, there is an extension point called a Windows Service configuration. So this extension point uh, just defines uh, all the settings needed uh, for um, Windows Service Wrapper to run. You uh, may see that it's a bit old style, but uh, basically it's um, a structural repository with a number of classes, uh, some overrides, and this is uh, what we need to configure. All these options at the moment come from uh, configuration XML files. There are also default settings. Uh, so which we can use. So you can see that uh, not uh, all settings are actually defined. So if you're not familiar with uh, .NET, here we use a lot of properties. Uh, so it saves a lot of time on getters, setters, default initializers, and other things. So I'm still waiting for Java to have a similar syntax sugar like C sharp. Uh, but yeah. This is what our configuration, including defaults. And um, this is our service descriptor. So service descriptor is a class which basically takes XML as an argument and uh, extracts all this data from XML uh, upon request. Um, and then uh, this file can be consumed. So what it means, uh, if you take a look at this code, yeah, you can see that uh, there is constructor, and then uh, there, is a, a, uh, there is a lot of different uh, utility logic, like parts, uh, extracting files from XML, et cetera. Uh, but what actually happens, every time you need a particular argument, so for example, when you need to retrieve a working directory uh, for your Windows Service Wrapper, uh, um, your um, uh, code uh, goes, goes uh, to XML uh, DOM and uh, extracts data from there. It's good from the point of view that uh, basically all configs are supplied on demand, but it's bad because uh, all uh, configs are also verified on demand. So right now we don't have uh, startup time verification except a few options. So for example, the, if you need uh, stop arguments, so stop arguments is uh, uh, basically uh, arguments for additional stop executable, which can be uh, invoked uh, on the termination. So this code will be uh, processed only when you start termination. And if there is an error there, basically it's too late. Uh, because you want to terminate this service, your configuration is broken, so most likely uh, nothing good is going to happen after that. This is the main weakness of this approach, and hopefully we, would, uh, we could change it uh, during this project. Okay, so how is uh, this file used? Let's go back to our um, uh, main uh, C-sharp. So, yeah, there is a lot of logic there, but basically we need to find a main function. Just a second. And here what we do, we basically run these arguments. We receive from CLI. So right now there is no special 
um, uh, common line interface processing. So all of CLI is processed basically manually, which again, I think we could uh, change. Go to definition. It's here. So here, for example, you can see the execution logic. So we just uh, initialize the descriptor. He treats our configuration. Um, right now, the configuration is basically hard coded, so you cannot uh, change the file path. There is a pull request from Budika which changes the data, and hopefully we will integrate it soon. And after that, we initialize loggers. So we use log for net, and we also connect the log for net uh, to um, uh, Windows uh, logs. Why we need that? Uh, so if you admin, you can uh, uh, see system events in your administration panel. So we connect the Windows Service Tracker to that by default. And after that, we just start uh, initializing the service. So you can see that there is some command processing. But uh, yeah, interesting things uh, start here. Uh, so there are commands like install, union install, start, stop, and all of them have handlers. Um, so these handlers can be executed and basically they do exactly what is needed. Uh, above, you can also see a, a suspicious elevated flag. So you may have seen that when I install the service, it basically asks for permission every elevation. It's a new feature implemented by Nextone. Before that, uh, you had to run uh, the executable as administrator. Now you don't have to do that because basically the executable itself uh, restarts itself and asks for elevation. Uh, it happens uh, thanks to this elevated uh, callback. So basically it just uh, receives parameters and uh, re-executes them. Okay, so let's uh, take a look for example at installation. And here you can see that Basically, in order to install the service, um, we do a lot of passes because, for example, there is interactive support for credentials. Um, there is also support for defining different accounts, uh, but at the end, it uh, invokes um, uh, standard libraries in order to create Windows service. So we don't uh, write to registry on our own at the moment. It was a case, for example, a couple of years ago, but now we mostly use uh, service managers so that uh, everything is installed uh, and registered here. Okay, I don't think we need to deep dive. Basically, it does all the configuration you have seen here. Okay, so all these options. Uh, but uh, after that, um, it's just the beginning. So once we install the service, we also need uh, to actually run that. So when we start the service, there is another logic included. Basically, we wrap executable and we try to execute that. So you can see that it can also elevate permissions uh, if needed, but then it basically starts the service. And uh, the service, once started up, it uh, receives all callbacks and starts all the initialization logic for our process. And the way it's uh, written, mm, just a second. So start service, what um, implementation of your corporate? Actually not. Mm. So just a second. Delete this view my system. I know it's it's in my schema. Yeah. So these are uh, handlers. Um, we execute including uh, create for services. And after that, um, we should really execute the thing. And let's just a second, let's find it. Uh, yeah. Just a second, I don't remember this part of the code, but okay. we have a way uh, to discover it easily. So we have um, our service descriptor. And here, for example, let's just take uh, executable. And let's uh, find the usages. Okay. So here you can uh, see a lot of logic. Start process. 
So actually it's uh, located uh, in main class. So yeah, it just starts with arguments. And here you can see that uh, it uh, starts the process with executable, it wraps all the arguments, it attaches a uh, uh, logger. So if you go to start the process logic, um, here you can see that uh, well, basically there is a, bu a bunch of arguments to process. Uh, and uh, this logic just uh, eventually, yeah, so there are hooks. So hooks are used uh, for extension invocation, like post termination, etc. Uh, but the most of the logic ha happens in the process helper. It's our own, own class, uh, which is uh, located in utility folders. And this own class is basically invokes process. Um, and uh, yeah, wraps it uh, by providing call the environment, by sending proper signals when you need to terminate the process. And uh, this data is basically fed by our configuration because all these options can be configured uh, in settings. And yeah, finally, you will just stop, stop, yeah, start process and wait for exit. So here you can see, for example, full installation. So we will need workspace, we will need arguments, we will need processes, etc. Uh, we set up environments for the process. Uh, environments, again, uh, they uh, come from configuration, uh, plus some additional options. And after that, we just start the process, uh, or basically form a executable string and launch that, and uh, capture all logs. So here you can see that we actually capture logs uh, from the process in order to generate log files as a part of our execution. This log file uh, is then consumed, for example, uh, by uh, upstream logging systems like Windows events or Jenkins can also capture these logs and even uh, add them to support bundles if needed. And uh, this is uh, handled by this handler. And finally, we just wait until um, the process exists uh, and we do it in a separate thread. So that's it. Okay, so I think we shouldn't uh, deep dive here. Uh, so dive deeper here. Uh, do you have any questions before we go to other parts? Yeah, sure. Well, it's you who will be coding that. So if you don't have questions, so then I am fine. I <laughs> think. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so for you, Budik, uh, the main classes of interest will be, of course, service descriptor, because most likely we will need to rebuild it completely. Uh, I started uh, doing some work when I was uh, uh, splitting the repositories. So now there is Windows service configuration, and uh, some uh, companies already support sub configuration files. So, for example, download uh, is located um, in a separate uh, repository. So we already have a kind of structure for configurations, uh, but we will need to map this uh, structure to YAML files so that uh, every section is implemented. And service descriptor most likely will do a major cleanup there. So another file which might be interesting to you is uh, yeah, this XML helper. So assuming that we have XSD uh, validation, most likely we will need uh, to add some logic here in order to uh, invoke verification. But this file is relatively simple. It's just whatever um, invocation which operates with DOM and has a lot of generics to simplify the things. Also has a lot of logic depending on uh, .NET version nowadays. Hopefully we will be able to drop .NET to the zero support so the code becomes much simple, simpler. Okay. So yeah, the code is relatively small. Uh, well, let's say it's much smaller than Jenkins core or many plugins like Git plugin, uh, but it's still pretty complicated. And we have some test coverage in order to verify that. So tests are uh, all implemented in the test repository. And here, for example, uh, well, basically we have a number of tests and test utils. Uh, and we use uh, an unit framework uh, in order to verify the tests. So basically an unit is just another implementation of X unit framework. 
uh, if you're familiar with so JUnit, um, it's more or less similar. And here you can see that we just have a number of tests. So for example, here main test uh, just verifies uh, whether common iterations could be done. Um, like printing help, so here we can invoke it. And, uh, From this one. Yeah, I thought that Visual Studio allows uh, to invoke it from here. Okay, if not, uh, it should be available here at this. Here, run test. So I'm not sure, but yeah, testing is a bit slow in Visual Studio. So here, what you can see that we do testing uh, for a number of configurations. Now, for example, here we have main test. Uh, so let's uh, yeah, let's stop the previous test run. Okay. So, yeah, let's rerun it. This interface is relatively new and it's still glitchy. Before that, uh, any unit had uh, um, <coughs> its own separate uh, uh, test UI. So here you can see that oh, I guess any unit still has it. So here you can see that we just execute the test. You can also potentially add additional outputs. I'm not sure what happens with it. Uh, but yeah, theoretically everything should be uh, operational and yeah, we know for sure that uh, these tests work. So they uh, may verify the results. Yeah, here's our standard output. Just didn't uh, change the focus. So here, for example, we, we expected that uh, we run uh, an existing command and uh, we got exception, so the test passed. So mm, that's the plan. Uh, okay, so for more advanced tests, yeah, we have some tests uh, for extensions, we have some tests for utilities. There is a lot of test helpers which uh, automate uh, processes and configs, etc. cetera. Uh, so you can see that um, there is uh, some test coverage. I don't uh, think that test coverage in this repository is perfect, but uh, at least we get enough smoke tests. And uh, there are obvious issues so why we cannot really test it entirely. Uh, because for example, in order to test uh, Windows Service Management, you need a Windows version, which actually supports that. So you need uh, to run as administrator. Uh, it's technically doable uh, now in uh, Azure DevOps. It wasn't doable before in, uh, um, so we were using RPR, and if you try to do it in Jenkins, most likely it won't be possible as well. But yeah, right now we don't have integration tests which would uh, verify the service part. So it's something we need to keep in mind because uh, this part uh, likely needs some manual testing. But you need to test fine. Okay, questions? Uh, can, can you explain the difference between the uh, starting in a CLI mode and service mode? Uh, you mean um, in uh, Windows services itself, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so basically, let's go to main. So in main, uh, we Mm -hmm. So right now we, yeah, just a second, we actually need to run. So here, um, how we uh, discover that, uh, we have a flag in CLI mode, basically checks the number of arguments. So if you supply more than uh, zero arguments, then you're running in CLI mode. And basically this is an interactive mode for admins. So for example, here help or whatever. So all these commands, uh, they're being executed uh, in the interactive mode. And uh, well, basically this is management CLI. If no commands supplied, uh, then uh, it will try to run as a service or it will assume that it runs as a service. There was a patch which uh, in recent versions where an extern uh, tried to improve this behavior. So for example, right now, if I just uh, run without parameters, it will show me that I cannot start service from command line or a debugger when the service must first be installed or whatever. So basically it tried to start as a service 
you tried to retrieve a service metadata, it failed, and you get an error. So this behavior is not ideal. It would be better to just print help. Um, and uh, yeah, the next term tried to do that uh, a while ago. So in version 2.6.0, this didn't really work out and we had to revert this patch because it caused regressions. So right now we are back to uh, not the ideal behavior, but at least it works. Okay, so when we run uh, VS non-service mode, basically everything uh, runs as CLI. So nothing uh, uh, specific. Uh, so here we still uh, retrieve Windows service metadata, etc. Uh, but it runs basically as a common CLI application with all these commands, etc. With service mode, of course, it becomes a bit uh, more interesting. So here you can see that we actually start a new instance of Windows Service Tracker. Um, and uh, what does this method does? Let's just, uh, so yeah, we start a service base. So the service base is the default API supplied uh, by Win API, which uh, defines all the service behavior uh, callbacks because uh, operating system will be talking to us. Um, and let's take a look at our service wrapper. So our service wrapper is uh, defined uh, within the library and it has a number of flags, but actually it needs to supply some information like version, for example, it needs uh, to hold the process uh, and other definitions for runtime. It also needs to expose to the status. So this is uh, uh, common logic and here, for example, we start the service and pass service descriptor. So basically we pass configuration uh, here and then our service uh, will be basically managed by Windows. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of logic there. Uh, so move file, etc. cetera. Uh, the, this is a startup logic um, where we process configurations. Uh, where it actually starts, there is on start method and the on start method, uh, well, uh, what it happens, we first we retrieve environment variables, this is defined by our configuration, then we handle file copies. So uh, there is a way in Windows Service Wrapper to implement a data migration. For example, if you want to update the service, if you want to change the configuration, you can uh, define uh, migration in the configuration file and uh, this uh, file copies actually does that. After that, uh, it does downloads. So here you can uh, see a funny thing already that the uh, code uh, appears completely differently on Linux. Uh, and uh, on uh, basically it's uh, .NET 4.6.1 and also uh, .NET Core. So he, uh, here we use uh, .NET features, but for all the versions, we don't really have uh, st standard methods uh, to download files, etc. So we'll just uh, do it uh, manually using uh, again a uh, code base in the repository. So here we download all files configured by the configuration and so on and so on. So basically Windows service uh, will implement the hook and uh, do all this management. Same for shutdown. When it receives a shutdown, uh, it uh, processes the hook from uh, again Windows Server management interface. And here we just stop the service uh, after receiving. Again, we do a lot of configuration processing, etc. but basically, it's an intelligent version of uh, killing the process with some logic. And here we have a super useful uh, feature in configuration. It can beep on the shutdown. And yeah, it was implemented long ago, but it's still a part of the system configuration if you need that. Okay, does it answer your question, Budika? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, the code. Actually, the code uh, is the relatively simple in configuration management part. Yes, it's not this simple in uh, all this uh, service descriptor and callbacks, but hopefully we won't need to modify the code too much during this project. Uh, but yeah, that's the plan. Um, let's take a look at how it's used on the Jenkins side. So in Jenkins side, 
by default, uh, in Windows Service Wrapper, uh, we publish uh, GitHub releases. We also publish uh, versions to NuGet. Uh, but uh, Jenkins uses additional uh, way to retrieve the repositories. Uh, so, for example, this is a bit strange. Okay. Uh, but here, for example, we can go to um, our repositories and, uh, well, to the Jenkins repositories. And here's uh, the first thing you can discover is maybe packaging for Windows Service Wrapper. It's a historic artifacts because uh, Jenkins build flows uh, really uh, rely on uh, Maven packaging. And here we can repackage artifacts um, as Maven and deploy them to Jenkins uh, Maven repository. So this is uh, the repository which we actually consume uh, within uh, uh, Jenkins. And uh, basically, if you go to um, our artifactory, here you can see that yeah, it's just a Windows Service Wrapper, and here you have a number of versions. So the last release was 2.7.0. And here you can see that we actually include uh, .NET 4, .NET 4.6.1, and uh, MT version, which is actually .NET 2. So this is all we include uh, right now. We didn't publish uh, .NET Core versions, but yeah, most likely we won't need that uh, if we ever decide to do that. So where is this library consumed? Uh, we have uh, um, three areas. Uh, so firstly, it's Jenkins code itself. Uh, so Jenkins CI. Mm, sorry. Grab Jenkins CI Jenkins. So in Jenkins repository, we include Windows Service Wrapper in order to support installing Jenkins as a service after it, um, after it started up. So here, for example, you can see that there is Windows Service Lifecycle. So it's a special logic which allows uh, Jenkins to properly operate as a Windows Service. So for example, here it can uh, self-update the Windows Service wrapper if needed. Uh, and for that, uh, it uses uh, this uh, file migration schema, which uh, you have seen in the config. Also, for example, it uh, supports the restart logic. So you can restart from the web UI uh, if you use Windows service and uh, other some, uh, such bits. Uh, so this logic exists, um, but the first thing that I'm not really sure that this logic is being used by anyone nowadays. Um, so how we actually recommend uh, installing Jenkins on Windows, if you go to our download site, Jenkins are your um, download, here you can see that uh, you can just uh, download Windows and it offers you an MSI package. So for example here, I'm not sure what, yeah, it offers me to download Jenkins MSI. Uh, this MSI file is defined in packaging. Right now we are working on uh, uh, completely replacing packaging for new core release automation flow. But in principle, it's uh, the same. There is an installer and this installer um, uh, is based on Wix. Um, it's a Windows Installer Toolkit, and it uh, actually includes uh, the same Windows Service Wrapper uh, with uh, um, XML configurations. So here you can see that yeah, there is, for example, exec config file. Uh, XML file is being generated somewhere in the scripts, and we bundle Windows Service Wrapper as well. Any questions? Ah, no. Mike has uh, to drop. Okay, so this is Windows Service. Another area when uh, we work, uh, we use uh, Windows Service is actually for agents. So there is a Windows Agent Installer repository, and this repository again uses Windows Service Wrapper in order to install agents on Jenkins. Uh, there is some magic there, but if you, you go to this repository, you can see that uh, there is XML file which actually is a template. So here you can see that uh, the, uh, this is a template XML file. Um, we have some code generation where we inject IDs, where we inject uh, Java versions, special machine arguments, um, and also we inject agent download URLs because uh, Jenkins supports automatic upgrade of uh, um, uh, agent jars and of uh, Windows Service Wrapper. And uh, in order to do that, we just uh, co-generate config dependent on the configurations. 
So for HTTPS, we enable that. For if your instance is exposed via HTTP, no, it's not enabled. Okay. Uh, likely we will have to do some updates in these components during the project in order to apply new features uh, to Jenkins. So for example, to support configuration with YAML, but it's likely a second or third code phase. So right now we do not have to worry about that. And yeah, maybe another component you may to know about, though we definitely won't be touching that. Uh, VMI Windows Agents plugin or historically Windows Slaves plugin. So this plugin actually allows to use a Windows uh, Service Management interface in order to install uh, agents as services remotely using uh, DCOM uh, and uh, other remote communication services. So you can connect to remote uh, Windows instance. You can install a Windows agent on there, connect your master and keep using it as, a, as an agent. So you know, this uh, tooling uh, works pretty fine. It's widely used, but at the same time, uh, I wouldn't recommend it uh, for modern uh, Jenkins setups. Okay, these are four main use cases um, within the Jenkins project. And I believe if you just Google for Windows Service Wrapper in the network, you can find more usages. Again, Jenkins is just one of examples uh, where Windows Service Wrapper is used. Okay, Budika, do you have any questions? Do you want uh, to clarify anything? Uh, I think I had uh, OCC during uh, one survey. So, okay, I have some problems then. Okay, now uh, after this uh, uh, mm -hmm. code session, I have to uh, document. Uh, documented this uh, uh, what we discussing here so uh, i would like to ask you what are the aspects that i have to cover uh, during the documentation okay, let's take a look i think uh, i mean uh, almost all the thing that you discussed here i think uh, also covered in uh, yeah. github uh, default yeah so that's why we have a substance criteria in this project so right now we need this code dev session so basically you expect to create a new developer guide, which is relatively short. It would include uh, a review of the project structure. So basically uh, the first thing we've been doing in this video, and which would just include uh, a link to this video. That's it. So now you are not expected to document everything we discussed today, uh, just yeah. on a uh, top level um, so that it can help potential contributors uh, uh, to start the developing uh, the component. That's it. Okay. So I, I had to maintain external document, or I, I don't I think I don't have to update it into the repository or something like that. Sorry. Uh, I just have to maintain an external document. I think I don't have to update into uh, Markdown or anything. Else. No, it's um, no. I think it should be in the repository because we prefer okay. to follow the documentation as code approach, uh, but uh, it can be a new file. So for example, how I will see that. So there is doc folder here, for example, we create a folder for developer documentation. Mm -hmm. And there you can just uh, create a file project structure and, view and uh, then link it from contributing guidelines. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So anything else uh, to discuss today? Uh, I think it's uh, pretty much clear. Uh, if there's anything I can, I think I can ask in the uh, Yeah, right. So uh, yeah, again, it's just the first uh, overview. We didn't really deep dive in the configuration. Yeah, there is a lot of information to process, um, but yeah, we can do it incrementally. So. I definitely do not uh, expect you to digest all this information uh, right now. And, yeah, we have a lot of time to discuss it. Okay. So, if there is no other topics, again. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. So next time we meet will be next Tuesday. And today we can uh, have a follow-up discussion. So if you have any questions, 
uh, we can deep dive in particular com uh, areas there. And I'm happy to do more sessions if you need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you too. So then I will stop the recording and I will uh, try to publish the video by the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Happy to help and thanks for working on this project. So, yeah, you have already built it uh, locally. So, yeah, <laughs> now we can uh, try to do some patches and uh, let's see how it goes. Okay. Thank you and have a nice day.